Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for stopping by the Tech Theater this afternoon to learn a little bit about the new standard on the biological evaluation of gas pathways. Uh, before I jump into it, though, I'm just take a second to introduce myself. My name is James Lyons. I'm a toxicologist with Eurofins Medical Device Testing. Um, I have a PhD from the University of Maryland. I have spent the last hmm, almost 10 years now in biomedical research in one capacity or another uh, before joining Eurofins to really leverage that research experience and background in physiology to evaluate the toxicological risk and biocompatibility of medical devices. Um, if you don't know much about Eurofins, uh, we're a global analytical testing laboratory. We have 16 laboratories around the world, um, including North America, Europe and Asia Pacific, and we offer a full range of medical device testing, everything from basic material and chemical characterization through biocompatibility, all the way up to package testing and as much as uh, pallet level transit testing. Um, so with that, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, the new biological evaluation of gas pathways, standard ISO 18562, uh, came out in March of last year. I know there's kind of been a, a bit of a scramble in the industry to try to figure out this testing and how can we satisfy these requirements for our uh, regulatory submissions and the things like that. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just kind of go into some of the details of this testing, uh, what is required, you know, how some of the testing is performed, things like that. Just give you a kind of a broad overview of the new standard and, and what all is involved. So I'm sure some of us are probably familiar with this, the classic matrix of biocompatibility testing from the ISO 10993 series. Uh, one thing that's you know, obviously missing from this, though, is that evaluation of breathing gas pathways. So in the past, uh, biocompatibility experts have kind of considered these devices external communicating devices. Uh, the inside of the gas stream is not actually contacting the patient, but those gases are flowing through those devices and then eventually into the patient. Uh, unfortunately, what they'll do is just kind of go down this checklist and check off these biocompatibility tests. And sometimes that'll lead to some of these tests having questionable benefit to the actual evaluation of these devices. and can actually lead to some of those uh, hazards going undetected. Uh, so that kind of gave birth to this new ISO standard that specifically looks at these gas pathways and how they can be adequately uh, evaluated for safety. So ISO 18562 is made up of four parts. Uh, the first part is testing within this risk management system uh, or process, and it's very similar to what we see in the ISO 10993 series. Uh, making sure we leverage the risks and the benefits of the device as well as the the workflow of testing that needs to be done in order to mitigate or evaluate that risk. Uh, part two, three, and four really dive into the actual testing that's required. Uh, and this includes testing for the emissions of particulate matter in part two, uh, testing for the emissions of volatile organic compounds in part three, as well as testing for leachables and condensate uh, in part four. And, I'll kind of walk through each of these sections in detail as we go through the presentation this afternoon. So ISO 18562 outlines this huge scope of medical devices that fall under these requirements and require some of this testing. Uh, and it actually states in part one of the, the standard that any of the devices that uh, have gas pathways, the parts and accessories of these devices, which are intended to provide respiratory care to patients, uh, supply substances via the respiratory tract in all environments. You know, and this is kind of a very broad scope and uh, covers a vast array of different devices. And this includes everything from simple oxygen tubes or you know, oxygen face masks to much more complicated devices like oxygen concentrators and ventilators and things like that. Uh, but one important note is that it includes all those consumable accessories that also go along with these devices. So things like filters, for example, also fall under the scope of ISO 18562. So this is a modified flow chart uh, from part one of the standard. Uh, and it kind of follows, like I said, very similar to the 10993 series, where you start by identifying all the potential hazards that come with the use of a medical device. Now, of course, most of those hazards are going to be evaluated under the 10993 series of standards. However, there's going to be a subset of these hazards that are specific to that gas pathway. Uh, and these are the, pa the hazards that are going to be evaluated under 18562. 
ultimately, there's a, a three kind of phases to this evaluation. Uh, there's the emissions data, which is outlined in the you know, succeeding parts of the standard. There's a set of toxicological data and a toxicological evaluation that goes along with these testing. And then ultimately a risk benefit analysis. You know, so does the benefit of using this device outweigh, outweigh the risks of those hazards during use? And it's really all of this data and information taken in total that's used to assess the biocompatibility of your device uh, and define the acceptability of that gas pathway breathing device. So what are some of the potential hazards that we see in specific to the gas pathways for these breathing devices? Well, the first one is particulate matter. Uh, and this is the one that's tested under part two of the standard. And ISO 18562 outlines two size ranges. Uh, and this has to do with the hazard of different size part particulates. So PM10 is particulates that fall between 2.5 microns and 10 microns. These are a little bit larger particles, so they don't quite penetrate as deep into the patient's lungs. So they're a little bit less hazard than some of the smaller particles. Uh, the second size range is 2.5 microns, all the way down to 0.2 microns in size. And these are a little bit more dangerous particles. They can penetrate deeper into the lungs, can very easily bypass some of the body's natural defense mechanisms. Uh, the next important hazard that needs to be evaluated under 18562 are the volatile organic compounds. Uh, and these are compounds that by nature can actually aerosolize and be carried by that gas stream and delivered to the patient uh, through their respiratory tract. Finally, there's leachable substances that can form in condensate. Uh, and this comes into a play when there's uh, humidity within that gas stream, condensation can form, and ultimately that condensation can reach the patient. Now, while ISO 18562 specifically speaks to these three ha uh, hazards, we've also seen in some cases the FDA ask for additional tests as well. And these include tests for ozone, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Uh, and it kind of foreshadows the future iterations of the standard as it evolves and becomes uh, more widespread and more of a standard practice. Um, and although ISO 18562 doesn't really speak about these uh, in detail. I am going to mention them as well, just you know, to kind of give you guys some more information. So the first thing we have to do before we really jump into testing these hazards is design this test plan around the standard uh, using some of the information that it gives you. Uh, the first thing you need to take into account is the patient types. So the breathing rate of an adult patient is going to be very different from that of a neonatal patient or an infant. Uh, and the standard's very clear that we want to try to mimic the clinical use of these devices during the testing. So very important when we're designing a test plan to make sure that we're designing the testing for the intended patient population. We also want to look at the duration of use. Uh, of course, particulates, volatiles are going to kind of diminish over time, uh, but we still want to make sure that we're really focusing on that worst case scenario. So if you have a device that is potentially used permanently. So you know, a good example would be an oxygen tube for a patient that is gonna use that for the rest of their life. Uh, it's not really appropriate, appropriate to test that for say 24 hours or just a few days. You know, we really wanna to try to go out long enough to make sure that we cover all the potential hazards or compounds or particulates, things that can come out of that medical device. Uh, one thing that's sometimes overlooked, uh, especially for volatile organic compounds, is we want to make sure that we're testing these devices at the maximum rated ambient temperature. Uh, so some of these devices can be intended to be used at an elevated temperature. Uh, and one of example is for uh, intubation tubes, things like that will actually go down into the patient's uh, trachea. Those devices are going to be essentially warmed up to body temperature. Uh, by nature, volatile organic compounds are more volatile the higher the temperature. So in some cases, when these devices are heated to, say, body temperature, uh, they can release many more volatiles than you would see coming out in room temperature. We also look at the, the intended use of the device in terms of, do they have different operating uh, modes or flow rates? So there are cases where devices can be intended to be used on both adult patients as well as infants or children, um, and they have different modes for those different patients. So what we want to try to do is make sure, again, we mimic that worst case scenario. So, you know, are we, are we truly evaluating the, the potential for these volatile organics that come out and, and the total dose of these volatile organic compounds that can reach the patient? You know, if we're 
testing in a, an operating mode that's intended for an adult, you know, there's a much higher breathing volume. You know, we could be kind of uh, underestimating the risk that could be uh, seen in a child or uh, an infant patient. And then, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago, it's important to make sure we test any of those consumables that go with the device. So if you have a device that requires a filter, uh, that filter needs to be in place when we actually do the testing because it is actually going to be part of that gas stream that's being delivered to the patient. A few more things to kind of keep in mind when we're designing that test plan, um, and you work closely with the test laboratories for, for these things. Uh, you want to make sure that they're using the appropriate sample collection and analysis equipment. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that as we go through the different parts of the standard and different equipment that can be used. Uh, one important thing to remember is the input air needs to be monitored. Uh, some of these tests can drag out for several weeks uh, as far as a month-long study, continuous airflow through these devices that we're going to sample. Now, if you have a long weekend, for example, and you go home, come back on Monday, but there was a huge drop in the airflow over the weekend, if that's not being monitored, you could be underestimating the risk to the patient. Um, so we want to make sure that that's monitored so that those types of things can be seen and uh, accounted for. Or in some cases, if it's a, a significant drop in the airflow or a significant spike, uh, sometimes it may even be required that we start the experiment over, start the testing over to make sure that we're uh, adequately uh, mimicking that clinical use. Uh, again, temperature and humidity control as well, especially in the case if you're looking at leachables in the condensate. Uh, if the device is not intended to have any humidity, you want to make sure that you're not artificially uh, introducing that humidity to the device. Um, and it's a, actually a good segue into the next thing here from uh, Joe's talk for this. We talked about the different GLP, GMP standards. It's important to make sure your testing laboratory is following some of these standards, uh, GMP, GLP if you're getting into some of the uh, animal testing, as well as ISO 17025 accreditation. Uh, just so you make sure you have those quality checks in place, uh, and there's not any issues down the road if you are you know, generating this data for regulatory submissions. ISO 18562 is very specific about the flow rates that should be used to mimic the clinical use of these devices. Um, you know, you can see the, the difference between an adult and a neonatal patient, you know, 0.15 liters per minute compared to a 13.8 liters per minute. It's you know, several, several orders of magnitude higher. Uh, and this is really where we get into that risk-based approach and making sure that we mimic that clinical use, we mimic that worst case scenario. So ISO 18562 Part 2 is the test for emissions of particulate matter in these gas pathways. Uh, and there's two methods that are outlined in the standard. The first one is the filter uh, testing method. And this is a, a pretty simple, conceptually simple method. Uh, it's been used by environmental testing laboratories for decades. Um, but when it comes to testing medical devices, practically this becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, so when we're talking about medical devices, we're typically talking about very, very low amounts of particulate matter. Um, the specification actually is in the micrograms per meter cubed uh, range. Uh, so in order to be able to test that from a filter method, you have to have a very, very uh, uh, accurate analytical balance to be able to measure those differences in mass. Um, and there's even been some cases where you see problems with moisture collection. Uh, some laboratories and uh, publications will actually recommend maintaining these filters in environmentally controlled chambers for as many as three weeks before and after testing in order to equalize that moisture collection. Um, so it is possible to be used for some of these um, medical devices. It's just a, a little bit challenging to work with in the lab. Um, and it ultimately requires much longer sampling time. So you know, if you have a device that goes out maybe 30 days or longer, it, it could be a, an option, uh, but for some of the short duration devices that you're going to test 24 hours or less, um, really probably not going to work very well. Uh, a more versatile method and uh, one that we recommend is a particle counter method. And these are analytical devices that use a light scattering type technique where they can actually measure the single particulates uh, and they're 
different versions of, these, versions of these devices. You can either get ones that just count the particulates. You can also get ones that actually give you a direct mass output, which is good in the case of ISO 18562 because the specifications are in mass. Now, if you do have a just traditional particle counter, just counting the number of particles that go by, uh, there is a, a pretty handy calculation outlined in ISO 18562 that allows you to convert that part particle count to a mass, uh, basically just using some assumptions about the materials in the device, depending on the types of polymers used for those, those devices and things like that. So as I mentioned, uh, the specification is in uh, micrograms per meter cubed, uh, looking at the mass, total mass of these particulates that come out of the device. So for PM 2.5, those particles that are a little bit more hazardous can penetrate deeper into the lungs. Uh, we really want to make sure that there's less than or equal to 12 micrograms per meter cubed of particulate matter coming out of these devices. And on, for PM10, the, the slightly less hazardous particulates, uh, yes? No, so it's, it's not really based on the material. It's more based on size and um, a little bit of geometry, but mainly on the size of the particulates. Um, so like I said, depends on, depending on the size of the particulates, they can penetrate deeper into the lungs and can more easily bypass some of the natural de defense mechanisms of the body. Um, and it's, it's actually interesting that you bring that up because the reason that the standard stops at PM10 is because typical particulates that are larger than 10 microns uh, usually aren't aerosolized very well. So they actually just kind of fall to the side of the device or something like that. They can't be picked up by that gas stream and delivered to the patients. So ISO 18562 part three is tests for volatile organic compounds being emitted from the devices. Uh, and there's really one widely accepted method for doing this, and that's thermal desorption. Um, and there's two ways to collect these samples. There's the uh, thermal desorption tubes as well as like vacuum canisters that kind of work in the same manner. Uh, and it, when it comes to sampling and collecting these samples and uh, you know, looking at these gas streams, it's important to make sure that your testing laboratory is using the appropriate blank samples. So a lot of times when these systems are being developed for testing these gas streams, they are tubing and piping and valves and uh, maybe regulators and flow meters and all these things involved in this sampling. All of those can be sources of volatile organic compounds, especially if they're made out of you know, plastic components or there's lubricants or things like that in the system. So it's very important to make sure that the appropriate blank samples are in place so that you're sure that those volatile organic compounds that are being detected are in fact coming from the medical device and are not byproducts from the, the sampling system. Uh, once you have collected these uh, samples, uh, you take these tubes or these canisters over to your thermal desorption unit. Uh, and basically what they'll do, is, how, how these work in general, I guess, is these tubes and these canisters, canisters are packed with this absorbent, absorbent material that will catch any of these volatile organic compounds that come through. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, volatile organic compounds by nature become more volatile with increased temperature. So basically what happens is your thermal desorption unit will heat these tubes or the canisters to very high temperatures and that will allow these compounds to become more volatile and actually desorb off of them and be able to enter the, the machines or the equipment for analysis. Uh, the main way that we an analyze these compounds after we kind of desorb them off of these tubes is by uh, GCMS which is gas, chromato gas chromatography mass spectroscopy. Uh, ISO 18562 doesn't really speak to aldehydes too much, but uh, some labs will also recommend using HPLC to look at some of the aldehydes that can come out of these gas streams. <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, so we also, uh, uh, ISO 18562 is not very prescriptive with some of these uh, methods. Um, and it actually just says, you know, as long as you're analyzing and identifying these compounds uh, according to accepted standards, so ISO 16000, uh, ASTM, EPA standards, or something equivalent, uh, then that's sufficient to actually uh, evaluate the biocompatibility of these devices. And again, you know, I, I can't really stress enough in, in terms of these volatile organic compounds that we really need to make sure we're keeping these devices at, at the maximum rated temperature in order to make sure we're sampling that worst case scenario.
part three of ISO 18.562 looks at the, uh, or is, uh, again, the volatile organic compounds. Uh, this section of the standard is very specific about the time intervals for sampling these air gas streams. Uh, these thermal desorption tubes and canisters, they, they kind of have a limit to how much volatile organic compounds they can hold. Um, so you really can't continuously sample over 24 hours, otherwise they'll just uh, be saturated and you know you could lose some significant amounts of information from, from that. Uh, so 18.562 lays out you know, three overall schemes for how you can uh, sample these uh, volatile organic compounds. The first is being for limited exposure devices, so devices that are typically used less than 24 hours. Uh, they recommend sampling continuously if you can. Uh, sometimes, like I said, you can kind of saturate those tubes. Um, or you sample at equal intervals throughout the testing. So at the start of testing, you sample for a certain amount of time, and then again after 24 hours. And then again, similar schemes that for longer duration devices. So usually start at the beginning test of the testing, you sample uh, after 24 hours, and then you know later on in, in the testing, whether it be after one week or after two weeks or 30 days, et cetera. Uh, and, and the reason that that they do this is because you know it's pretty well known that these volatile organic compounds will diminish over time, uh, and it, it it kind of brings up a, a little bit of a positive note on some of these tests, especially for the duration the devices that are meant to be used for long term duration. You know, if you sample a device at the start of the testing, run your analysis, sample it again after 24 hours, run anal the analysis again, but you see that all these organic compounds that are coming out of these devices are now falling below levels of uh, concern, and you know you can work out some of these thresholds with your toxicologists or uh, the toxicologists at the testing laboratories. There's no need to go out and test further. You know, if after 24 hours you see no volatile organic compounds that are coming out of the device above these thresholds, you can just kind of end the testing there because you're confident that over time there's just going to be less and less of these compounds coming out. ISO 18.562 Part 4 is the one that looks at the leachables and condensate. Um, and there's really three re requirements that need to be met in order to even need to evaluate leachables and condensate. Uh, and this comes into play when the, there's a chance that the device can reach 100% uh, saturation with water in within that gas stream. Uh, when this Condensate can actually form on the surface of these materials within the gas stream, and that liquid condensate can then reach the patient. Uh, and you really want to make sure that your device is meeting all three of these requirements before you actually go in and spend the money on that testing. Uh, and one thing that I note about part four of these leachables and condensate is that if you've already done uh, extractables and leachables, chemical characterization according to the 10993 series, there's no need to do part four of ISO 18562 because ultimately it's the exact same test. Basically what we do is we perform an aqueous extraction of the internal interior surfaces of that gas pathway. Um, you can either follow 10993-12 uh, or an equivalent method. Uh, ISO 18562 also suggests using a clinically relevant use of the device to cause that condensation to form. Or you can also circulate an aqueous solution through that device. Um, ultimately, the 10993 part 12 extraction is the simplest method uh, and the one that most laboratories will likely recommend. After you ex collect these extracts, uh, you need to determine the metal ion concentration uh, using USP 223 or uh, equivalent method. Um, this is typically done by ICP-OES, uh, as well as identifying and quantifying organic impurities by GCMS again. Now, ISO 18562 doesn't specifically speak to LCMS. Uh, we also recommend using that, especially since we're using uh, uh, aqueous extraction. Uh, and this looks at more of the semi-volatile or, or uh, less volatile compounds that can be coming out of these devices, uh, especially in the a case of condensate. And again, I just want to reiterate that you know if these devices have already been evaluated according to the 10993 series, there's really no need to further evaluate this condensate. 
So once all this information is collected, uh, volatile organic compounds, uh, leachables in the condensate, uh, ISO 18562 recommends a full toxicological evaluation on these compounds. Um, again, it, you know, we use a, a threshold of toxicological concern or a TTC method in which we only look at the compounds that are above this threshold, the ones that we think will cause a concern. And ISO uh, 18562 actually recommends doing this according to the 10993 series, uh, part 17. But inter interestingly enough, it outlines a specific TTC values just for gas pathways. Uh, and these are actually a, a little bit higher uh, values than what we would see in uh, typical TTC values for like uh, genotoxic impurities, uh, things like that, according to the ICH standards and some others. Uh, so the authors of this standard have really taken uh, care of trying to make sure that they're mitigating all these risks and making sure everything's being sufficiently evaluated uh, so that there's not concern for patients. Now, if there is any of these compounds that end up, you know, posing a toxicological concern, uh, 18562 recommends biocompati biocompatibility testing as necessary, uh, specifically cytotoxicity and sensitization according to the 10993 series, uh, part five and part 10 respectively. Now, as I mentioned, ISO 18562 doesn't really speak too much about carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, uh, but we have had some experience with the FDA asking for some of these testing. Um, not really sure why they want carbon monoxide testing, as it's usually a byproduct of combustion, but unless your ventilator is using a gas engine to run it, it's not going to be much of an issue. Uh, but carbon dioxide can be a little bit of an issue in terms of devices like oxygen concentrators, because if they're concentrating oxygen, you know, that, that airflow is also made up of other uh, gas molecules, including carbon dioxide. So if they're concentrating oxygen, they're also going to be concentrating that carbon dioxide as kind of an indirect product. Um, there's a various research grade monitors out there that can be used. Um, most of them pretty well equipped to test both carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And because there's not really any uh, mention of these in 18562, we kind of default to the uh, national ambient air quality standards for our specifications here, uh, which are 9 ppm for carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide really shouldn't be elevated above background levels. And we recommend working with a toxicologist to figure out exactly what those background levels are or should be within those medical devices. Uh, the other testing that we've seen asked for is ozone testing. Uh, these, again, not uh, mentioned in ISO 18562, uh, but can be important when you get into things like ionizing air purifiers, where those air molecules are being charged uh, that can cause the formation of ozone. Uh, and these are usually tested using UV absorbance analyzers. And again, there's a variety of research grade uh, equipment on the market. You can work with your testing laboratory, make sure they're using something that's suitable for this testing. And again, there isn't really any standards in ISO 18562 for these specifications. Uh, so we, again, default to known uh, regulations or standards, uh, in this case, the FDA guideline for medical devices on ozone, uh, and which they recommend making sure that the levels stay below 0 0.5 parts per million. So this new standard came out. All of this testing needs to be done. Uh, I know sometimes from a, a medical device manufacturer or a medical device company, it can kind of seem like a headache. But it turns out that some of these tests are actually very important, especially for gas pathways. Uh, particulates in volatile organic compounds can be pretty damaging to patients, uh, especially you know, particulates can cause significant lung irritation, which can lead to many downstream problems, including uh, increased permeability permeability, uh, heart problems and dysfunction. Uh, volatile organic compounds can lead to much more permanent uh, health issues, including cancer, liver and kidney disease, um, and in some cases, even central nervous system damage. So ultimately, the reason for all of these testing is patient safety. Um, but there's also another side to that, and that's you know ultimately time is money. So. There was a study that came out from uh, some researchers at Stanford a few years ago where they looked at the medical device industry's experience with interacting with the FDA on their submissions. Uh, and 
I think this was about 2016 or so, so my numbers may need to be uh, updated a little bit for last year. Uh, but there's around 4,000 510K applications approved per year by the FDA. Now, the FDA reports the review time for that was three months. Of course, medical device companies uh, kind of disagree with that. They say it's more like 10 months. Uh, but this study found that uh, every additional month working through the 510K or PMA process itself costs more than $520,000 or $740,000 uh, respectively. So what this kind of boils down to is that a complete submission is very important for saving time, saving money. Uh, and that's where some of these gas pathway testings come into play and making sure that these devices are sufficiently evaluated for the biocompatibility and the safety for patients so that the FDA doesn't come back asking for more tests and then ultimately cost more time and more money. Uh, so with that, uh, open it up to questions if anybody has any. Um, we're located in booth 636, which is actually right outside of the tech theater here. If you have any further questions about gas pathways or even just in general medical device testing.